Thank you. I'm going to be very brief in introducing this. I'm not an expert on natural hazards myself, as you may be able to work out from the programme, but uh, the programme misleads you into thinking perhaps that there are only two or three such people here with us this afternoon. In fact, there's a lot more, perhaps, as you can see from these names up here. We're going to have four presentations in this um, next session, each of 15 minutes, from completely different points of view, from earth scientist, lawyer, uh, archaeologist and anthropologist. Uh, on this issue, different aspects of it, and then we're going to break after tea, we're going to reconvene back here, and then Sarah and Dorothy are sitting over there, who convene our master's program in natural hazards and disasters here at the ANU, are going to introduce you to the exercise we're going to undertake after the break in our breakout groups. Uh, I might do a little bit of that as well. So, I'm just going to uh, introduce our speakers. Each is going to speak for 15 minutes. We have a timekeeping method here. Who's going to be the timekeeper? I thought it was Darren. Well, it'll have to be Stan. Okay. Uh, for the benefit of the speakers, a yellow card means you have five minutes to go, a red card means that you have one minute to go, and the bell means you shut up. Right? So, that way we'll get to have a tea break. Okay, so our first speaker is Alana from Geoscience Australia, who is in your program. Thank you, and thank you for uh, welcoming me here today and inviting me to speak. Um, it seems to be a very interesting forum covering many different topics. Today I'm going to give um, some background into uh, natural hazard risk in the Asia-Pacific region, but I will give more strong examples about the Pacific. Um, so I work at Geoscience Australia and we work in partnership with AusAid to better understand um, the risks from natural hazards in the Asia-Pacific region. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why we do it, our approach, um, some examples for volcanic eruptions, tsunami and cyclone and give some comparative risks. I'll also talk a little bit uh, very briefly about some of the work that we do in the Asia-Pacific region. So, um, AusAid released a disaster risk reduction policy in 2009 and basically their goal is to reduce vulnerability and, and enhance the resilience of countries and communities to natural disasters. So this forms a guideline for how AusAid delivers aid programs across the Asia Pacific region. Um, they aim to integrate disaster risk reduction into the aid program, so that means for example if they're building schools in Indonesia they make sure those schools are resistant to earthquakes, for example. Um, strengthening capacity of part partner countries to reduce disaster risk. So one of the, the area we engage in here is in understanding the risk. It's very difficult to reduce the risk from natural hazards and climate change if you actually don't understand what those risks are. And supporting and enhancing leadership and advocacy in disaster risk reduction and coordinating di disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Ultimately, to the villager, Disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation are one and the same thing. Um, it doesn't really matter if your com community is destroyed by a cyclone um, that was a disaster or a cyclone that has been exacerbated by climate change. It's still a cyclone. So understanding how those risks affect communities. Oops. So a hazard. Basically, the likelihood and the magnitude of a potentially harmful event that can occur at any location. An earthquake in Alaska where there's nobody living there is just a hazard and quite frankly very few people will care about it other than from a scientific perspective. The issue comes when we add vulnerability and exposure. So if you have a city that experiences an earthquake that can be disastrous. If that city then has inherent vulnerabilities such as um, very weakened or structures that are not able to withstand earthquake shaking, then you in, end up with enhanced risk. So the risk is the combination of the hazard, the vulnerability and exposure. And we can illustrate that in a triangle. What, one thing we know, we can't control the hazard. You know, earthquakes will happen, volcanic eruptions will happen, cyclones will happen, there's nothing we can do about it. But what we can do is reduce exposure, but most importantly, what we can do is reduce the vulnerability. So making sure our communities are resilient to natural hazards. Risk in the Asia-Pacific region. Now this graphic is a land scan image, which is basically population density across the Asia-Pacific. And if you'll notice from this, it pretty much looks like Australia is empty, 
uh, in comparison to India, for example. Um, so very quickly, you can see that these great populations in China, India, Indonesia, particularly Java, mean that anything that happens in those areas is likely to be high impact to a large number of populations. Can we put on locations of volcanoes? And 200 million people in the Asia Pacific live within 50 kilometers of volcano. So that means a fairly moderate eruption will disrupt the lives of a lot of people and potentially their livelihoods. Earthquakes, again you see the problem. Same with tsunami, cyclones. So we know we have a problem. Particularly, we have uh, very vulnerable populations in the Asia-Pacific region exposed to a multitude of different natural hazards. So in 2007, AusAid asked GA to do a study, um, basically to take available information to understand natural hazard risks in the Asia-Pacific region. And what we wanted to do is broadly characterise the location and potential consequences of rapid onset hazards. So, for example, we didn't look at drought and identify countries or regions with the highest risk from natural hazards. What made it unique is it focused on Australian government or AusAid interests. It was multi-hazard and we separated the frequent low impact events from the rare high impact events. And we captured impact in broad terms. But look, it was very indicative, it was rough as guts, but it allows AusAid to prioritise when they had no means of prioritising activities in the past. This was our survey area. We had primary focus countries, countries of interest, and secondary focus. And those definitions of countries is, is in line with the Australian government aid policy as it was back then. It may have changed somewhat. So we assess significantly impacted. That means death, injury, potential displacement, significant damage to agriculture, horticulture, water, essential supplies. And we also classified catastrophic disasters, ones that impacted more than 1% of the population as, as being something that the country would unlikely be able to withstand without significant <coughs> external aid. So from volcanic eruptions, um, many people think that volcanic eruptions are fairly harmless and in many parts of the world they have been to date. But as you can see from this photo here, volcanic ash would be fairly insidious. This is in Rabaul and Papua New Guinea and can destroy a lot. Our analysis, analysis showed that um, for places specifically in the Pacific, that Papua New Guinea had the chance of a VI4, uh, similar to the um, magnitude scale, scale for earthquakes, we can look at volcanic eruptions, and a VI4 eruption would be similar to um, Mount St. Helens or slightly smaller, um, Rabaul in Papua New Guinea. So there's pretty high frequency of large events, basically. Vanuatu the same. Tonga, slightly less. Interesting, for Solomon Islands, Fiji and Samoa, we didn't have enough data to make an assessment. So in terms of volcanic risk to populations, we can plot this chart here. And what's interesting is, not surprisingly, Indonesia and the Philippines stand out as having very high risks for populations. Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu and Tonga less so. But when we look at catastrophic risks in terms of the percentage impacted, this is where the small island nations, such as Vanuatu and Tonga, can be very severely affected by disasters. So not high numbers, but high percentages of their population, which would really impact on a country's ability to respond to its own natural disaster. And particularly for the Pacific, um, Disasters impacting more than 1% of the population can be expected at least twice a century in Vanuatu. So that's very, very high recurrence intervals, and Vanuatu has historically had some very, very large eruptions. Solomon Islands could be a similar potential, but we don't know enough about the volcanic activity of the Solomon Islands to make an assessment. Tsunami risk. This is some work that Phil Cummins, who's in our audience, did. And this is doing a very coarse assessment of risks from tsunami and using some metrics around how close <coughs> populations are to the coastline. This is a very scary looking figure, sort of like the teeth of the Pacific, I don't know. But basically these are wave amplitudes. 
Um, so remembering with a tsunami, it's offshore amplitude may seem very small, but what happens when tsunamis get closer to shore, they shoal and grow. So 75 centimetres may not seem like a lot, but that would be a catastrophic tsunami on the coastline. And as you can see, for our Pacific countries, we've got very, very high risk up through Vanuatu, Tonga, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea. Remembering, of course, where this study was pre the recent Tonga Samoa tsunami, so once again feels accurately <laughs> predicted tsunami risk. But you can see right across the Asia Pacific it's very high. And for population risks for the Pacific, um, Vanuatu again um, seems to be very high in terms of percentage impacted. Okay, moving along. From cyclone, as you can see from this figure, we get very, very frequent cyclones across the Pacific and also across the Philippines. And for the Pacific, in terms of ranking for wind hazard, Fiji and Vanuatu are very, very high. Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, also very high. So we can actually summarise these results for these priority countries or primary focus countries. And you can see that Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, have very, very high risk from multiple hazards, particularly the geological hazards, but many of the countries have uh, risks from meteorological hazards. What's also telling from this graph is that for many of the hazards, we couldn't assess the risks because of lack of data. So our summary findings was that Pacific countries have very high potential for catastrophic disasters, and that the gaps in natural hazard information actually precludes meaningful hazard and risk analysis. So just quickly touching on the work that we do with AusAid, we have pro a number of programs. In the Pacific, we've been working with SOPAC for many years um, to develop and maintain a tsunami hazard modelling capability. We've got a program in Papua New Guinea that's recently started looking, working with the government of Papua New Guinea to look at tsunami, earthquake and volcanic hazards. We have a program in metro the metropolitan Manila and across in Indonesia, we have a number of programs. So these programs are not about Geoscience Australia assessing the risks. These are all about us working in partnership with our counterparts in these countries to share information, share expertise, and share knowledge to understand these risks. And in the Pacific, uh, again, this is work that Phil Cummins has been involved in. Uh, following the tsunami in Samoa, we have some questions. Would a better warning system have helped? Was the public awareness good enough? What more could we do? And following on from that, there's some preliminary inundation, tsunami inundation modelling in Tonga, suggesting that in the event of a tsunami, there will be substantial inundation, and that what we need to do is do detailed tsunami inundation modelling that allows people to prepare for evacuation and land planning. So the study I did was, we did, was very coarse, rough as guts, it helps provide some knowledge base, but it's no good for evacuation planning, decisions on land use planning. What you need to do is drop that hazard and risk analysis right down to the local level to enable that. And that's all, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, the, the small historical long-term context for uh, natural hazards in, in both Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Um, some pictures there are just of, of a recent 2005 uplift event um, on the left here um, showing the, the, from the uh, western province area where you can see these raised coral um, reef beds um, uh, have been uplifted by more than 1.5 metres. So it's, there's some, um, the Solomon Islands particularly I think is an incredibly shaky place. Um, I come from Christchurch, New Zealand, which is also a very shaky place, but um, this is nothing in comparison with, with the Solomon Islands in many respects. Uh, so I've just got back from the Solomon Islands where I've been collecting lots of tubes of mud, and I'll, I'll, try, I'll do my best to explain a little bit about what I'm doing there. Uh, this is the western, map of Western, western Province, which I, I think we'll be looking at a bit later, just showing the sort of general population densities, the, the areas in red with the most population densities, and going down to green with less so. And the areas I've been working are in Tedapari here in Mendoza and on the south coast of New Georgia here. But I'm going to be talking about this in the context of both 
looking at this is a recent geological map of that particular 2005 earthquake where you had uplift events and the big red dots there of more than two meters and the big blue dots is where it says subsidence of around about one and a half meters so this is this is pretty crazy activity and then there was another earthquake in 2009 which caused a large tsunami and then there were similar uplift and subsidence events on Tetapari and Mendoza where I've been working. Um, so what I've been doing is going out and collecting sediment cores. Um, this is actually an aid of, of a completely different project in a sense. Um, still looking at similar things but we're in, in the sense of looking at natural hazards but more on a long term scale. So these are a, one of a, a set of about 10 lakes which I've been working on. I should say they're full of crocodiles, you can't see them there, but we could, um, which we're collecting these sediment archives. And this is all in aid of a, a project looking at long-term climatic patterns. We're looking at algal lipids, which we can use as a proxy for looking at rainfall changes in, in, the, um, in the past. So this is a crocodile that had been um, killed off by uh, the Ramsey Australian Police Force. They're the only ones who have guns these days. And, so they have a program to actually um, try and reduce the numbers of crocodiles in these areas, but that's just nothing much to do with this talk, but anyway. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to be racing through, and so one of the, the key programs with that particular project is looking at extreme rainfall events. And um, the Solomon Islands is very interesting in many respects because it's quite vulnerable to El Nino. I'm not going to talk about that in detail because this is, this is one of the three talks that I've got. Um, this is an image of the firestorm that, that um, prevailed over the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia during 1997. It misses the Solomon Islands, but there was an, a similar effect in many parts of the Solomons as well, um, where you had large-scale fires due to extreme drought. And so this is what we're interested in here. This is some work I've been doing with um, a colleague from uh, Washington University in Seattle, and he's looking at rain gauges, which are these lakes essentially that have built up these algal mats which we can look at um, as proxies of changing rainfall. And what he's shown is that within the last 500 years you've had extreme shifts of uh, this band of high rainfall here. You've got up to four metres of rainfall, four to five metres in the areas of pink that you see there crossing the Pacific. And that includes also parts of the Solomons as this tongue that comes out and overlaps the Solomons and goes out towards Fiji. But what happened about 500 years ago, it seems that this whole band shifted by about five to 600 kilometers further south. So, and it happened within the space of around 50 years. Suddenly you had one area of uh, where Washington Island is, which had, um, you know, you previously had up to about four meters of rainfall. And then suddenly that shifted to only having about a meter of rainfall. And you can kind of imagine what kinds of consequences this might have had on local populations um, at the time. Having said that, Washington Island had, was abandoned about 700 years ago by the first settlers of that island. Um, so what we do is we go around and collect um, lake cores and we, we, look, we look for lipids and we can construct quite detailed diagrams. I'm not going to go into that. This, this is probably the second of the, the, the three talks that I'm going to give. But the kinds of things we look at are these algal bands that you see here and we can collect isotopic data which tell us about changing rainfall patterns and we can radiocarbon date these and it tells us you know, a lot about how things have changed. Okay, so moving on from there. Now, one of the other interests that I have, getting onto the third talk, uh, is looking at um, the last thousand years and adaptations thereof of, of indigenous people across different parts of the Pacific. Looking at the effects of natural events such as cyclones, earthquakes, volcanism, but also more abrupt and long-term changes such as sea level and climatic change and, and broader ecological changes. Um, so I'll, I'll move through and, and I'm interested in how this sort of fits in with the modern context of such as the, you know, the Millennium, Millennium Development Goals and, and how people have actually adapted and what kinds of boxes we can tick that we can actually address using the historical sciences as well. So we can look at things like environmental sustainability, um, perhaps we can look at um, you know, what the effect of disease might have been and so on and so forth. But basically there's only a few things that we can potentially address um, from these particular goals, but these are, these are worth focusing on. And I think the, the number one is poverty, hunger and, the, and hunger in the past as well. We can look at how societies have sustained themselves despite 
Um, hello. It's disappeared. Why is that? Here it goes. I don't know if you keep moving. Um, and so how societies have sustained themselves, and one of the key things there is looking at, well, um, the development of agriculture in, the, in these regions as well as perhaps the main mechanism which can alleviate poverty and hunger and sustain food security. But then we have to look at these other effects of, you know, more general um, you know, processes that societies go through that, that affect um, development and um, where in, in this sense, you know, I'm asking whether in fact, people are perhaps the biggest problem to development as opposed to any other kind of natural hazard. And here's just an image of Chinatown and Honiara um, in the, the event of 2006. Um, and and how, so how can we disentangle the effects of humans and, and natural hazards? So that's, that's the core question here. And on the surface, it seems that people were adapting fairly well in, in many parts of the world. But increasingly, you have to deal with quite strange people like myself in remote communities in Papua New Guinea. Um, so my main role is digging into the past. So I spend a lot of time, um, usually beyond my knees in mud, um, digging up sediments and trying to extract fossil traces, which actually tell us about how the environment's changed and, and how people might have been influencing that change. And so this is from a, a bog in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. And so if, if you can't address your question, then the, my, my theory is you should just dig deeper, and that's exactly what I do. <laughs> um, so, one of the key things we have to do, one, that I've been work, working with a group from Otago University in New Zealand, is looking at human adaptation over the long term. And one of the interesting things about some parts of high, high elevation areas of Papua New Guinea is that we know that people have been living there for the past 49, in this case, to 44,000 years. Um, and this is at Kossipi Swamp here, this is an airstrip and you can see a village in the background and this whole landscape is built upon a volcanic landscape. There was an eruption around 50,000 years ago which deposited up to three metres in places of volcanic ash and there's pretty well no way that anyone could survive that. But on top of those sediments you find a rich array of stone tools and artefacts which suggest that people were were, um, and, and in fact you can almost look in any part of the landscape, you can dig a hole and you'll probably find a stone tool like this. This is what we were finding working at Kossipi Swamp. And so this is the brown layer here, you can see, which is the ash layer, and embedded within that is, is a whole bunch of stone tools and artefacts. So this is a, a pretty seriously transformed landscape which people are, are doing quite well. And we can look at different fossil traces which represent you know, people's manipulation of certain plants starchy foods and so on, which they're extracting from that landscape. So it's not just in, in, um, in that particular context, but we've got other evidence where, for example, on the Huon Peninsula in, in the uh, eastern part of the main um, chain of Papua New Guinea, you see these raised uh, terraces which um, have been driven up by earthquakes over the last 250,000 years. And we're finding stone tools actually scattered across uh, layers which um, you know, show that basically people were occupying that area around 40,000 years ago as well. So again, it's like, so you've got volcanism and earthquakes and so on. Um, and, and, but these, these records have been used for a number of other things, but I'm, I'm running out of time. One of the key things that we, we're looking at in, as archaeologists in Papua New Guinea is looking at agricultural development, as I was saying. So one of the things we can look at is um, how that's developed, and this is in Cook Swamp in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, where it seems that people were creating drainage ditches in, um, in um, uh, boggy sediments um, to drain them to, to establish um, root crop agriculture. But the other striking thing about this site, and here's some other, other areas of agricultural land in different parts of the highlands of Papua New Guinea, is that here's a sediment core taken through um, in different parts and it's in different catchments surrounding the Cook Swamp area in the highlands where you can see these yellow bands which represent you know, significant layers of volcanic ash that have been feeding into that site. And uh, so, uh, okay, and so we've got, I'm off soon. Okay, and so we've got, <laughs> thanks Paul. So we've got st strong evidence of you know, frequent overtopping of fine ashes, but this may actually replenish gardens. So in, in some senses, you know, volcanic ashes might be quite helpful. Whereas in other areas, such as on, in West New Britain, we've got examples where it seems that people were moving off, off um, those islands as well, moving to other areas and then reoccupying 
those particular places later on. And so there's a bunch of archaeological sequences that's just showing some of the large volcanoes that exist in that particular region as well. Um, so uh, so it, when we've got dates on some of the larger volcanic ashes that existed. And then so you see this interceding periods where essentially people are occupying the landscape and then they move off. Um, the final thing I was going to talk about was looking at more in the recent term, and I'm flicking through to the, this is probably the fourth talk actually. This is one of the remote uh, Solomon Islands in the eastern part of the archipelago where it's um, incredibly vulnerable to things like earthquakes and cyclones in particular. And I've got some images um, of uh, some of the cyclones that, the, the last cyclone that, that stripped this island bare, this is Cyclone Zoe in 2003, and it completely stripped the vegetation. It was like putting a lawnmower over an island and stripping it bare. Uh, but no one died on this particular island and they could sustain themselves quite well for um, uh, the, the preceding um, period. And one of the interesting facets of, East, of Tiko Pier, this particular island, is that people have been living there in these sorts of conditions with frequent cyclones, it seems, of a period of city of about 10 years, they get a, a category four or five cyclone which completely annihilates their resources, but they've been sufficiently independent to be able to develop strategies to deal with this. And this is one of the things that I'm working on, but it looks like I've run out of time, so I'll, I'll have to address that perhaps in the, the discussion session that we'll be having later on on the Solomon Islands. Thank you very much. Right, so yes, we're going to head down a somewhat different track now in terms of the idea of hazards in the uh, Pacific region. Whilst the background for this presentation is climate change, which undeniably, undeniably presents difficult challenges in the region, I'm interested in how, in the climate change context, problematic moral geographies are created and shaped, ones that posit the islands at once as victim and yet dispensable and burden these sites with providing the proof of the global climate change crisis. What I'm particularly interested in here is how legal discourses use apparently threatened Pacific Islands as laboratories of legal abstraction or experimental spaces through which legal utopias are imagined, filtered, or interpreted, creating, if you want, a kind of moral hazard whereby legal fictionalizing will find its truest expression only should the islands indeed disappear. Well, uh, what, do I, what do I mean by the idea of the islands being used, at least metaphorically, as spaces of experimentation? Well, the concept of island laboratories or islands as experimental realms has long been implicated in the cultural subjugation of islanders. Island, scholars, uh, island scholar Beth Greenhow, for example, has observed that islands occupy an unusual and privileged place within the history of academia as spaces that echo um, the ideal conditions of the laboratory. Somewhat more critically, Godfrey Baldacino has pointed out that Western fascination with islands is often constituted by the fact that they suggest themselves as potential laboratories for any conceiv conceivable human project in thought or action. Good. Early 20th century Western preoc preoccupations with Pacific Islands, for example, tended to, be, uh, tended to use what were considered remote, undeveloped human colonies scattered across a vast and empty expanse of sea for particular Western and usually positivist forms of knowledge generation. And I've put up an example there that some of you might be familiar with from Margaret Mead. Interest in the islands often did not stem from a view of these spaces or their populations as necessarily of interest in their own right, but as potential laboratories in which to study models, ideas, or systems of concern to more complex Western or often Western societies. Simultaneously, the islands continue to be constructed as sites in which modernity can never be realized, providing the backdrop only to satiate Western appetite for exotic locations and the simple unspoiled life. The TV show Survivor may perhaps be a good example of this uh, latter issue. How the dynamic uh, of the island laboratory may be playing out again in the climate change context has been the subject of some analysis. Briefly, the last 10 years have seen a proliferation of increasingly dramatic rhetoric and imagery of disappearing islands, 
portrayed as apparently on the verge of evacuation with island populations in imminent danger of becoming so-called climate refugees. I'm sure many of you have kind of followed such uh, discourses in the popular media as well. Al Gore's famous documentary that came out in 2006 called An Inconvenient Truth is one of several instances in which the disappearance of at least some Pacific Islands as inhabitable spaces is portrayed as, in, as an event already in the past. He was particularly concerned about the islands of uh, Tuvalu. Partly with horror and partly with perverse impatience, we're all invited to watch, often from a distance, for the first island to disappear. In a sense, the islands are thus enlisted to help visualize the often complex and intangible climate change phenomenon. More cynically, however, it is clear that the goal, perversely, may not be the saving of the islands themselves, but planetary salvation. The islands are recruited to prompt non-islanders to act on climate change and have become the poster child to caution about the excesses and sins of Western consumer capitalism. They may even be framed as an acceptable sacrifice in efforts to prove that climate change is real. Should they disappear, no nothing seems as cynical a resolution as trying to recreate them with the waste products of Western uh, culture or the very products implicated in generating global warming in the first place. In the case that I have put up uh, on the screen, a Dutch enterprise has proposed to use pl plastic waste products uh, to repurpose floating exotic island spaces, for example. What interests me in all this is the role played by law, or perhaps rather legal discourse, which curiously appears to await the demise of island nations rather impatiently. In the words of one legal scholar, and I've put the quote up there, predictions of whole countries disappearing Atlantis style beneath, beneath the waves raises fascinating legal issues. This kind of sentiment is shared particularly by international lawyers, the kind of people amongst whom I work. The fascinating legal questions anticipated by such scholars tend to evolve around three areas of inquiry, all interconnected, of course. Firstly, the loss of territory. Secondly, questions of sovereignty and statehood. And finally, the issue of migration. Territory, in a sense that due to sea level rise, it would likely, uh, territory would likely be shrinking, and with it, inhabitable land and maritime boundaries. Sovereignty and statehood is an issue in a sense that uninhabitable or sinking islands may struggle to continue to fulfill the criteria for statehood. And migration is part of this discourse in a sense that it is sometimes posed as the only remaining option for at least the inhabitants of the very low-lying islands. Remember that in the case of an inconvenient truth, several islands are apparently already evacuated. Where we return to the idea of the islands as experimental spaces or laboratories of interest to international lawyers is in the barely disguised fact that islands threatened by climate change represent the perfect opportunity to test out the notion of the deterritorialized state and Western cosmopolitan hopes for a post-Westphalian international order, one historically so strongly tied to the existence of territorially defined nations. As one international lawyer has put it, sinking islands provide the perfect opportunity to dissolve the notion of the territorially, territorially bound state. But experimentation does not stop there. Legal minds and others have been busy suggesting various pathways through which the deterritorialized state could continue to exist. First, for example, we have the suggestion of simply sticking a, a lighthouse-type tall structure on existing islands that would serve as a sovereignty marker of a kind should whole island nations later be submerged. Legal minds have also suggested that the loss of sovereignty could be prevented simply by building sea defenses around an island. Perhaps more in engineering than a legal solution, the problem here may be the prohibitive cost of such an arrangement. The second or bottom uh, photo I have put up there is of the Japanese, out, uh, the Japanese outpost, and I'm going to 
probably mispronounced this, of Oki no Toreshima, a set of rocks the Japanese government spent three billion US dollars to protect in order to claim as part of its territory, thereby extending it, its exclusive economic zone uh, significantly. Finding the resources to make this a viable scheme for the Pacific Islands facing sea level rise is rather doubtful. Another legal utopia sometimes advanced includes the idea that if territory of an island nation becomes uninhabitable, land could perhaps be bought or ceded by another na nation elsewhere, where the state would then continue to exist. Of course, the problem with this issue is that even if such a deal could be worked out, land ceded would likely be completely devoid of any use or purpose. It would be marginal, not arable, without infrastructure and natural resources. In other words, expendable to the, uh, to the nation that would seed or sell it. The Pacific region is of course not devoid of experience with this sort of arrangement. I'm thinking here, for example, of the resettlement of Banaba Islanders after World War II to the Fijian island of Rabi. Ongoing problems experienced with land rights, citizenship, financial hardship, and of course loss of culture, identity, and language should further caution us against seeing this as a viable solution. <clears throat> My personal favorite, and perhaps the most neo-colonial of them all emerged from a recent conference on threatened island nations in New York. International lawyers there debated in all seriousness the possibility of the resurrection of a kind of trusteeship system that would support governments in exile, despite the fact that in the past, Pacific Islander experience with this had been far from positive, permitting as it did, for example, the nuclear testing carried out in the Marshall Islands in the 1940s to 1960s. Right, so what do we make of all this? My talk has not been about suggesting that climate change does not present real challenges and hazards for the region. I am also not suge suggesting that law does not have a role to play in resolving such challenges. My concern is rather that a moral hazard is created when disappearing islands function as little more than a kind of laboratory in which Western cosmopolitan hopes, anxieties, and utopias are nurtured. The legal discourse implicated in this has had little regard for law's historic role in rationalizing the expansion of Western nations into the life spaces of other peoples, or law's role in creating the very conditions that may now, now threaten islands, or indeed the priorities of islanders as opposed to island states themselves. A weird dichotomy has been created between wanting to save the islands and keenly anticipating their disappearance because it would allow us to take debates out of the realm of legal abstraction. Although the Pacific Islands are undoubtedly the recipients of our compassion, Tuvalu is the real deal as the photo uh, exemplifies up there, the question that beckons is whether they matter in their own right. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, uh, I didn't quite know what the other speakers were going to be <clears throat> presenting on, so I can see now that to give you some perspective, uh, there's been... Uh, those, those previous talks were quite global, or regional, in their perspective. What I'm going to talk about is a practical example of planning which is involving hazard risk management in a fairly localised area, and it's in East New Britain, in Papua New Guinea. Um, and uh, the, the Papua New, East New Britain isn't really being, uh, the, the, the current and present risk isn't exactly climate change, although that's a longer term risk, obviously. But there was a, there was a large eruption there in basically a volcano right, right behind or right beside the main town. Uh, of Rabaul, which is a, um, a port which was established in the early 1900s. And although there was a, an eruption there in the 1930s, which was pretty damaging, or n near there, uh, the township continued to grow and it became very important to not only East New Britain province, but the nearby provinces. But the thing about East New Britain is that it itself, because of the history, the geological history of volcanic eruption, had beautiful deep ash soils, ideal for agriculture. So it really tended to um, 
bring a lot of people in around, around the eruption area. So more recently, um, as Alana was talking about, there's been a project um, centred on capacity building for natural hazard planning. Uh, and that's, that's actually ongoing and um, I'll be going up with some other people at the end of this month to, to continue that process. So we're talking here about something that's actually in the process of formation uh, with the provincial government. Um, the provincial government on, on, its on its own behalf have just completed a 10 year development strategic plan but not yet with the, with the input so much the formal input of the natural hazard management work, so that's a bit topsy-turvy, um, but um, OSAID had just completed a study, well, it was a study I did actually, uh, which was on roads, road infrastructure and development in that, in that eruption landscape. So things have come from different points of view, that's, that's a real life policy situation. Um, I'll rapidly, God knows how I can do it really, but I'll talk about some of the socio-economic patterning so you can see what the context of trying to plan for, uh, you know, sort of um, risk minimisation is. Uh, some of the, the prevailing ideas among the provincial government, which may and may not be useful, um, how maybe we'd think about um, introducing risk management to the situation, um, maybe challenging some of the provincial government's um, uh, previous assumptions and I'm going to ask a question at the end about uh, whether there might be some different strategies to thinking about hazard reduction. Um, the one thing I would say about East New Britain is it's a fairly large province but most of the population actually live in a quite a small area and that's that area right next to the volcano. Um, because of the rich agricultural landscape and uh, industries that are built upon that you're getting a situation where more people want to come into the province. You know, it's one of the wealthier parts of Papua New Guinea. There's a lot of desperate parts of Papua New Guinea. So more people want to come into that part of the province. You're getting intensification right next to this hazard. Uh, it's, it's hard to stop. I mean, people see a better life there. Yeah, OK, there's a volcano, but hey, you know, that could blow up any time. Who knows? I'm hungry now. So uh, intensification is sort of driven by matters of the belly rather than, you know, sort of rational ideas from the head. Um, yeah, and the rest of the province is out there. It's quite empty, it's depopulating, it's very poor. Uh, uh, and those maps, one is showing up in the northeast corner that large population concentration. The second map, where it's blue, you can see people are moving away, where it's red, people are moving in. So apart from the evacuation around the actual volcano site itself, which is blue in the top right hand corner, uh, so there was evacuation there from the, the actual township of Rabal. But nearby, especially in this valley called the Warangoi Valley, people are moving in and intensifying. Whereas further away, in the rest of the uh, province, people are moving out. It's just too poor. They're moving up into the area near the volcano. So there's a challenge for the provincial government. Um, I won't go into those economic zones. It's suffice to say, uh, you know, you can see a gradation from, you know, the, the wealthy area right near the volcano where the rich agricultural lands are right through to agriculturally poor parts in the remote parts of the province. The economic context that the province has to deal with, you can see in this map, you know, it's an evidence-driven study, so we've got data and mapped it. Uh, you can see production of cocoa. The, the, I think I can use this thing to show where the volcano is there. That's where the eruption site is. OK, so cocoa is not growing around here because there's a lot of hills there. The actual volcano is more or less around the town. But in the rest of the area, there's these volcanic soils. So that's where people are getting their income from. And, you know, it's, it's in the volcanic risk region. Cocoa, oh, don't worry about that one, actually. Um, fresh, fresh produce, well, it's a similar sort of a thing. People are coming in from areas nearby around the volcanic eruption area. Um, and uh, uh, copper, the other crop, is a similar sort of thing. You can see the agricultural production is really concentrated in those volcanic areas. Um, I won't worry about that slide. It, now, so some sort of process of planning for eruption has been happening since the 94 volcano. And what, what they basically did after that volcanic eruption, 
they said, OK, well, we've got two goals. One is to restore the economy, try and sort of piece it together as it was, um, because things were laid waste, especially in, the, in what was then the provincial capital of Rabaul. But the other thing is, what do we do about um, future uh, eruptions? Well, let's try and relocate as many people as possible. So they relocated the town to the other side of the active caldera, which is sort of a half OK idea. It doesn't really get them out of the, the sort of the high, uh, the overall risk zone, but I suppose it does get people out of the very highest risk zone, um, relocating rural populations further away and then using roads and so on to try and restore linkages. So that's what they did. But here's a map of it. So there's the eruption. That pink is basically the ash fall. So you can see the ash fall distribution. Uh, you can see here um, what were defined by a geologists as zone of likely future eruptions. So that's the sort of the danger area, the highest danger area. Um, but there's also a, an ash hazard zone, which is this dotted line. And the current provincial town, which has been redeveloped, is sort of on the edge of that. So it's not really out of the eruption zone. And these yellow parts are where people were supposed to resettle. But the problem was with that early phase of uh, planning, you know, the current situation, or the situation in 1994 was in Rabaul, you have an urban population, some near urban populations with some agricultural land, market garden type stuff, and they got relocated, some urban people, the rural, pe rural people got relocated further away in the sort of the inland of the Gazelle Peninsula without much agricultural land. And they didn't actually like that, those, especially those rural people, they didn't like that. So a lot of those people just moved back into the eruption zone because, hey, you know, they're getting hungry, so uh, they, they go back to their old land, they can grow stuff, yeah, it might blow up, but hey, you've got to live for today too. Um, whereas maybe what they could have done, you know, urban population and your peri-urban areas, you try and recreate that a bit. In the, in the urban centre, the new urban centre. And if you've got to move people further away, give them agricultural land, that's what they live on. But yeah, it was a rushed process, things weren't thought through properly. So it didn't really work out too well. Um, the current version of planning is that people should move even further away. And um, it's based on the idea of growth, growth centres and corridors. I won't go through these, but here's a map. There's uh, Kokopo, and these are these growth centres that are proposed, and then some roads, proposed roads, going down to more population growth centres. Problem is, that kind of planning, you know, I ask them, but hang on, you know, like roads themselves don't cause development, you know? The, the basic point of an agricultural society like yours is you've got to have agricultural opportunity. That's, that's the only reason people move to a place. Like if they can grow stuff and eat it and sell it, they'll move there. But just by putting a road down to some place doesn't mean they'll go, oh, there's a road, let's move down to the whatever place. And there's really not much agricultural opportunity. So it's a bit of a kind of a doubtful plan they've got, really. Um, and, and some of it's just natural constraints. You know, this rainfall, great where the current population is. Hey, that's why they're there. Great soils, great, great rainfall. Gets increasingly worse as you go down through the province. That's why people aren't there. That's why they're moving away. You're not going to get people to move back to those places. You know, crop potential's really high where people live. It's low where people don't live. It's not rocket science. Um, you know, cocoa potential's similar. Um, so, the, I'm, I'm going to skip over these things too. The, the, the problem for the province is, yeah, this idea that um, maybe if we can try and move everybody away, that'll be the best thing. But, but it, it, it's not going to work because your conundrum is uh, you, your most productive area, the people where people want to live, is right on that volcanic ash deposit. That's where people want to live. Um, you're prone there to eruptions, you're prone, because also earthquakes are associated with it, you're prone to tsunamis, especially just along the coast, if people are living right on the coast. You know, like little flash ones, you know, big earthquake right next to, to that eruption area, bang, you're covered with water. 
But on the other hand, you, you can't really get away from that area without collapsing the economy. If you move away from those agricultural areas, if you, if you say, oh, all those shops and infrastructures, hey, it's just too risky, we'll move into you know, a much lower risk part of, the, part of the province. But there's nothing to do there. There's no agriculture. So you know, people are kind of stuck there. And you, you've got to find this balance. And that's, that's what the planning is really all about now. Um, there have been these competing solutions. Uh, there's been that process which I was partly showing you those maps of the uh, different sorts of production across the landscape, trying to use that kind of economic landscape analysis, looking at cost benefit of various infrastructure schemes to find feasible options. But we know that the bottom line is that people won't live where they can't grow crops if it's an agricultural society. Uh, so unless someone comes up with a real brainwave about some new agricultural opportunity, you're stuck with people being where they are. And uh, you, you know, building roads and so on to other parts of the province won't work. Um, and, and this is the thing. You know, this is where the anthropology, I guess, comes in. You're looking for what is it for common people to, to think about, just the ordinary person living in that area. <coughs> um, you, you know, are, are they thinking, and, the, and they are basically, thinking that it's better to live with that natural risk than to risk reducing your living standard by following the government, the provincial government's ideas that we all move away to other unproven places. And you know, living with risk, <coughs> there's a whole heap of things in people's minds about that. There's, there's their understanding of history, where their ancestors have come from. There's understanding of their culture, their cultural response to risk and what happens about even sort of things about life and death, you know, about, about how, how you would die. If you die in a volcano, what does that mean? If, if you're living on your sort of ancestral homeland. And economic aspects. So, um, yeah, so people are living there because of those um, uh, opportunities. Uh, you have to accept that. I'm getting a hurry up. I'm not going to finish this. In New Britain, we're thinking about a risk overlay concept. So looking at the economic context that of landscape uh, and looking at um, at the risk zoning and then overlaying those two um, and doing that at a very localised level, looking at that for particular functions, um, trying to avoid a lot of economic distortion uh, by using this sort of overlay concept but ultimately trying to balance risk versus amenity. And that's what we're trying to do and so that's, that's the ongoing process which will be continuing later this month. There we are. Thank you. Well, um, we've cut very well with time, so perhaps we've got time for a few questions. And we've got we've got a half hour tea break, so if anybody's got some questions, then there's one up the back there. Or any of the speakers. Are we going to do mobile um, thingies? Carry them around? There's another one, I don't <laughs> oh, you need to use that to uh, respond, that's right. Uh, my question is specifically directed to uh, Fanny. On, um, because we were dealing with international law, I mean, the concept of law and then climate change and certain parts of displacement and all that. Um, there, there have been several articles written um, over the past few years regarding the redefinition of the uh, Convention on Refugees. And um, a strong argument is that we cannot really fit um, climate change displaced people into the definition of refugees because the 1951 Convention is very strict as regards the um, qualifications, the five uh, qualifications, and that. Um, certain scholars would place it in a way that uh, because the 1950s was a period of political uh, dis uh, political um, dissonance and a lot of issues were politically based, it was a response at that time. So do you subscribe to the idea that um, we need to redefine or at least that the United Nations should at least um, be able to uh, redefine or, or put a new spin to the whole idea of a refugee to accommodate environmental refugees. Okay, I mean, it's a complex issue to try and answer in two minutes. I mean, first of all, uh, 
sort of the idea of perhaps we need to alter the refugee convention isn't the only idea out there in terms of trying to find a treaty-based uh, response to this. There are also ideas out there that say, why don't we have a protocol on climate refugees to the United Nations Framework Convention on climate change? Why don't we develop a whole new convention that separately deals with uh, this issue? But there are problems with all uh, of those approaches. In fact, out of the three I just mentioned, the one that tries to argue that we have uh, some kind of amendment or additional protocol to the refugee question is perhaps the weakest one. In fact, even though it has received the most uh, attention and seems sort of the most logical place to look for a place to fit kind of refugees, but it is probably the most inappropriate space of them all, not just because the convention has only five grounds on which you can base uh, on which you can base your refugee claim, also the convention is for persecution. And we can't necessarily say that a person who has to move on the project, well, we can't say in a straightforward way that such a person has uh, been persecuted, never mind for one of the five uh, reasons in the question. So a lot of the current thinking in international law is kind of, let's move away from this idea that we have a treaty-based response. There are a lot of other instruments, soft law instruments, and let's try and strengthen those, for example, through, through United Nations and the channels. Thanks. Any other? Yeah. Uh, I have a question to the first speaker. Uh, sorry, I can't uh, uh, remember your name. Uh, you were just talking about uh, the disaster in Asia Pacific uh, region. So uh, I have two uh, very quick but related questions. First one is while measuring the impact, whether you are just uh, just considering the people who are just directly affected uh, maybe with the tsunami or any other disaster or maybe the total number of people who are get uh, affected within three or six months because of the lack of food or clean water, this kind of things. This is my first question. And the second question is that whether just uh, measuring the, uh, the, the most vulnerable country, whether uh, you are just uh, thinking the all country, giving all countries the equal weight or whether you are just considering it in terms of the total number of people affected. Because if you just think about the small countries in the Asia Pacific Island, the, the maybe the Suleiman Island, but in if I just if you just consider another, for example, Bangladesh or India, maybe one percent impact maybe be greater than the ten percent impact in other small countries. So these are my two questions. Thank you. Okay, so for the first one, the total impact is very difficult to define. Typically, um, in disasters, you look at disaster statistics, they will be on fatalities, sometimes injuries, sometimes economic loss. And we felt that it didn't actually capture the full spectrum of disaster impacts, such as um, people that are displaced for long periods of time, such as after an off-hand interruption, and the other can return for 10 years or so. But our definition was much broader and did include um, people that are um, people who may lose access to basic services such as electricity or may have crop failures. So it was a much broader definition of impact that is typically used in reporting. Um, and that was largely due to our target audience being Aussie, which they and their role in their mandate is supporting people into recovery and development. Um, as to the second question, the metric of 1% affected being catastrophic was around a country's ability to respond itself. So for India, for example, 1% of the population, you still have 99% of the population of the government that may be unaffected and then mount a response internally without bringing in also. For a small island nation, 1% of the population affected may really disrupt the government's ability to support itself. And therefore, you will need external support from aid agencies or NGOs. So again, this is around why the report was developed, as to why we sort of use those metrics. Does that answer your well, Aussie has now decided that a country like Tuvalu can't uh, support itself even if it hasn't got any disasters, <laughs> even if everything's normal. Hmm. We have another one here. Um, I have a question from Mr. Matthew. Um, there's some slides that you have had skipped uh, yeah. when you were doing your presentation, but I caught you. Uh, <laughs> it's about the 
PNG people respond to the sea level rise uh, about 44,000 years ago. And uh, does it imply that um, sea level rise has been a problem since that long time ago? And uh, if yes, could you tell me no. the reason, please? Because uh, at that time, I'm sure that the greenhouse gas emission is not that high. Uh, no, there was not. There's no evidence of, of sea level rise actually 44,000 years ago. In fact, um, the other way around. It's quite the opposite. <laughs> Going down. Sea level evidence of sea level fall between around 26 and 18,000 years ago, where it dropped by about 120 meters. So it's quite the opposite effect, and that was during the, the last ice age when much of the the, the, the water on the globe was actually centered on the, the poles in Antarctica here in, in the Arctic. So quite quite the opposite effect. So, um, But having said that, there is some evidence within the last six to 4,000 years that in fact in some parts of Papua New Guinea sea level was up to around two meters higher than that present as well. So that's um, you know, going back much, you know, a, a few thousand years ago. So, but we actually don't know quite what the effect was. I mean, we know this has had some effect in other parts of the Pacific, such as in the uh, Tuamotu Archipelago, where, in fact, a lot of those islands only actually became exposed within the last 2,000 years or so, it became available for occupation. So, um, on the long-term, you know, sort of geological perspective of things, I, I think um, uh, it, it's quite a good perspective to have on in, in terms of adaptation as well. Thanks for your question. One more, two more, two more, and then we'll have tea break, I think. We'll see, yeah. My question is for Ian. Um, you mentioned um, something about um, finding a, a balance between um, uh, amenities and the risk um, in the high risk areas. Can you elaborate on um, possible um, remedies as to how the government can balance that um, um, amenities and uh, risk. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, what we'll be looking at in uh, at, at the end of the month will be trying to categorise what um, the vulnerability would be for different sorts of amenities. So, for example, uh, the, the current hospital, it's still there, is, is right in that volcanic uh, zone right where the uh, eruption was in 1994. It still hasn't been relocated. So there's a question about where to relocate it to, and um, one idea was to put it, you know, away from the volcanic eruption area. Uh, in fact, right down the other coast, where, where it would be hard for people to get to, but it would be on the coast. So uh, if you look at, say, the criteria of um, tsunami risk, if if there was a, a tsunami generated within the caldera, uh, it may not have had time to grow, but because it would possibly be powerful, it could just wipe out the hospital. Bang. That would be the first thing to go before even the rest of the population got affected. The hospital's gone. So that's probably not a good idea. And maybe it's an example of why you'd basically put a risk overlay on, on low-lying parts of the coast to say, well, you can't put essential services right on the coast. You, you wouldn't put an emergency response centre on the coast. It would get wiped out by a tsunami. But on the other hand, if you say, well, oh, let's play it really safe and we'll put all these important amenities way away from the coast and the volcanic activity centre. But that would be putting them away from the population too. So, yeah, you've covered risk, but say it was the hospital, put, you know, 50 kilometres inland, most people wouldn't go to the hospital anymore because it would be too far away. So, you've got to be able to try and balance the costs for people's everyday transactions with that amenity with like the uh, hazards. But we're thinking probably the way to do it is to, is to define what sort of amenity and how would it interact with the, with the hazard. Uh, you know, what would happen if it got wiped out. Um, housing, for example, if people live on the coast, which a lot of people do, uh, it's not great but if that's their personal decision or they don't have any options and the government can't do anything about it, uh, well, you know, I don't know, that's, that's something for, the, for the, um, those people at that planning workshop, especially people from East New Britain, to think about. You know, what, what about the scenario of those fatalities? 
but on other things such as yeah, uh, government sponsored amenity, um, uh, emergency response, hospitals and things like that, it's probably an obligation that they need to uh, zone those things so that they're not put in, in high risk places. And yet there's a mechanism to ensure they're not put in um, places which remove their amenity entirely. Yeah. One more question, because then uh, otherwise we'll run out of tea time. Okay, uh, this question is to Annie. Uh, congratulations, it was a wonderful presentation. I really loved it. Uh, actually, my question is a bit intense uh, in the sense that uh, we have all experienced historically, socio-historically, that there has been several kind of intervention from the Western world in uh, the underdeveloped and uh, the Oriental world, mostly. Uh, and uh, so, of course, it has brought about a lot of vast socio-historical changes in different realms. But uh, my question to you is that what's your views on uh, individual agency, free will and the autonomy in choosing uh, whether uh, like the, the ability to choose or not to choose any kind of outside intervention and what might be the inner, you know, uh, uh, deeper level impacts of it on the individual. Uh, Sorry, I'm not 100% sure what the question is. Yeah, my question is what's your views on the autonomy individual autonomy, uh, freedom, uh, free will and uh, agency in choosing or not to choose the outside intervention when it, it is introduced by any outside agency. To choose or not to choose? Not to choose, choose. and what might be the possible uh, impact of it um, during that process? Yeah. That that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I guess my question is, are you talking about literally at the individual person level? Are we talking about the individual oh. island level, or...? Uh, actually, or when I'm talking about the individual, I'm talking about the individual as per se, individuals in groups and individuals in communities as well. Okay. I mean, I guess, in a way, the point of my presentation really was, in a way, what your question is about, that law has kind of ignored that dimension. It's, yes. it's been this top-down uh, approach, like, we know what you will need, and there's been too little questioning about the role law can actually play or should play uh, on the ground. So I guess that is perhaps where more legal analysis uh, needs to happen rather than in the sort of theoretical uh, realm. Going to places perhaps along the lines of what Ian was talking about, where people are, do need to uh, read or even investigate the needs there and see, and see about the role that law can uh, play. I'm not the deal trying to say that's Okay.